Would you turn your Bibles with me to Romans chapter 12? Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I urge you, therefore, brethren, whenever the word therefore comes, in some translation, it starts with, therefore, I urge you, brethren. That means that it is connected to the, connected to the previous verses. And uh, we know the book of Romans is written in such a clear and systematic way as to how God um, picked up his people from sin, how the condition of the world was, and how he picked up and showed his mercy and uh, saved them and justified them by faith and delivered them from condemnation. And then he gave them a life where sin shall not have dominion over them. And uh, gave them the liberty of the sons of God and freedom from condemnation. If anyone is in Christ Jesus, the Bible says that there is no condemnation for him. So, having been given these promises to us, the writer to the Romans, the Apostle Paul, he writes, Therefore, he says, I urge you, brethren, it is not written to outsiders, it is written to believers in the church, those who have been washed, cleansed, and are being led by the Holy Spirit. To them, he writes, brethren, I urge you, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. See, many churches around us in Christendom, we see service people are mainly interested in doing so many things for the Lord, activities, 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 singing in the choir and taking Sunday school and leading the youth meeting and so many other activities in the church. And uh, they glory in that and they take shelter in that, thinking that, you know, I'm doing something for the Lord. But they don't see what the Lord expects of them. We read here clearly that this is your spiritual service of worship. What is that? It's, in, it's written clearly there. It is written that you present your bodies as a living and holy sacrifice. What is presenting our bodies as a living and holy sacrifice? Living sacrifice is one in which you sacrifice yourself when you are still alive. In the old covenant, there were sacrifices, burnt offerings and so many other sacrifices where they would cut up the animal piece by piece and then put it on the altar and offer it as a sacrifice. But here it is living sacrifice. Living sacrifice is that, that we are, in a sense, tied on the altar while we are still alive so that we cannot jump out of that when the fire is a little hot. That is a living sacrifice. I stay, I determine to stay there on the altar, being burnt up, allowing God to burn up all that is of chaff, all that is not of not wheat, but chaff. So I allow that, so that all that is of Adamic nature, I allow the Lord to burn it up, so that only that which is of God can be in me and be blessed and be increased for the glory of God. It says, this is your spiritual 
service of worship and how does this happen this happens do not be conformed to this world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of god is that which is good acceptable and perfect so all our transformation or change comes from being renewed in the spirit of our mind without being conformed to this world you know when ever since we were born into this world we are molded whether we liked it or not we are molded and squeezed into the mold of this world the lust of the flesh the lust of the eyes the pride of life and so many other things that we are surrounded by like media and worldliness and the way people uh, dress themselves and expose themselves and what we watch on the tv and what we read in the newspapers and uh, what we observe around us all that sort of you know squeezes us into this world's mold and paul says here that do not be conformed to this world by following the patterns of the world but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what the will of god is that which is good acceptable and perfect the transformation that the bible speaks of here is not a work of repairing it is not revamping it is not renovation it is totally something new you know whenever god wants to do something new he destroys the old one we read in second corinthians 5:17 if any man is in christ jesus he is a new creation old things have passed away behold all things have become new old things whatever old things were there god is not interested in building over them he is not interested in repairing and repainting and revamping them he is interested in demolishing it first of all the john the baptist said the axe is laid to the root you know god deals with the root he curses the root as it were like he did in the fig tree and the lord uproots all that and puts the axe to the root of the tree and then he kills the old man and he puts a new man a new spirit and a new mind he gives us whenever i think of this word transformation i think of that word transfiguration you know how jesus was transfigured on the mountain when he went along with peter james and john he was changed his appearance changed and they sort of had a glimpse of little bit of his glory that he had in heaven that is transfiguration incidentally the word trans transformation and transfiguration they come from the same root word metamorphosis metamorphosis you know what metamorphosis is it's it's something being changed in form and in shape and uh, from something earthly to something heavenly that is best described in the life of a, a butterfly you know how butterflies are born they don't come as uh, 
babies flying they are they are born from a egg and become caterpillar larva in a creepy crawly wiggly you know dirty looking uh, worm and it keeps on eating 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 leaves until it comes to a place where it has to spin a cocoon around it and that stage is called pupa and it remains in that for some time that reminds me of the word that isaiah says in chapter 40 they that wait upon the lord it's the waiting period in the cocoon for the pupa they that wait upon the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up like wings with wings like the eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint and this is what happens to that pupa after some time you know it breaks open that cocoon and then you know something strange and something unbelievable has happened inside there this is all the work of god a uh, creepy crawly ugly looking worm if god can transform that into something beautiful and glorious to look at and that which was crawling on the earth and eating the things of the earth takes wings and starts flying with such beauty which you and i cannot imagine the varieties of butterflies and moths that you see it starts flying and its food changes and its battlefield also changes it was earth bound once upon a time now it is heaven bound it's not on the earth anymore it is flying all the time and its food also changes from eating leaves it starts sucking nectar from flowers so it reminds me of how our life was before we came to christ those of us who have been born again repented of our old ways of life and gave our lives to jesus and the lord started working in us through his word and through his holy spirit he kept transforming us day by day day by day we read that in james chapter 1 verse 23 if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror see here the mirror is called the word of god the word of god is a mirror as i keep on reading god's word i get strengthened i not only see the glory of the lord in and through the scriptures but also i see my own condition it says in second corinthians 3:18 second corinthians 3:18 it says but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the lord are being transformed or transfigured or metamorphosized into the image from into the same image of jesus from glory to glory just as from the lord the spirit and if i don't have that desire to look at god's word and allow god's word and god's spirit to change me continually from glory to glory if i don't do that then i become like that man who looks um, in the mirror and then he goes away and immediately forgets what he has seen what kind of person he was but in verse 25 it says in james 125 the one who looks intently at the perfect law of liberty 
This is not law of Moses. This is not the Ten Commandments. This is called the law of liberty. The law of liberty is the law that God writes in our heart by the Holy Spirit in the New Covenant. He says, I'll give them a new heart and a new mind and I'll write my laws on their heart. This is the law of liberty, what God writes in our heart. And uh, he abides by it and not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer. This man will be blessed in whatever he does. This is the work of God. All our transformation begins in our mind. And the more we get transformed in our mind, the way we think um, and the way we get renewed by the word of God and allow it to work in us and we keep meditating upon God's word, it has power. You know, Hebrews 4.12, it says God's word is quick, means living and powerful. And it has life. Jesus said in John 6, he said, The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. When I read God's word, it is not just like I read the newspaper. Most, most of us don't read the newspaper a second time in our life. That is newspaper when we see the headlines and we put it away and that's it. We don't go back to it again, very rarely. But whereas the word of God is not like the newspaper or like any other book, it is living and powerful and it is life-giving. It has life and it is spirit. Jesus himself said that. And as we keep meditating upon God's word, we get renewed day by day. We get changed and transformed. And then we become changed more and more from glory to glory. And then, you know, like A.W. Tozer, he said, our mind is God's sanctuary. You want God to dwell in you? Then get your mind cleaned up. Jesus said, clean the inside of the cup first. He lambasted the Pharisees and the scribes in John. In Matthew 23, you read that when you go home. How many times he, he pronounced curse on them. O oh, unto you, scribes and Pharisees. O oh, unto you, scribes and Pharisees. He condemned them for their outward behavior, which was abominable in the sight of God. Because their inward life was rotten through and through, like it was like... Uh, uh, you know, like a grave. Outside it looks so beautiful. You know, sometimes when you go to the cemetery, you see some beautiful, uh, beautifully decorated uh, tombs, tombs, tombstones and some carvings on that. Looks so beautiful, but you dig up and see inside what is there, all rotten flesh and all decayed things stinky stench and no life so their lives were like that our lives were like that once upon a time before we came to Christ we were dead in our sins and trespasses the Bible says but God who is rich in mercy he quickened us and he gave us a new life and he transformed us and kept on transforming us we are being transformed every day we are being changed from glory to glory every day. And that happens by avoiding looking at the things around us. We walk not by sight, but by faith, the Bible says. And it happens by faith. It means that I believe completely in the veracity, 100% in the veracity of Jesus' unfailing word because his word is true. Jesus himself said that 
Thy word is truth. And Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And when I come to the Lord like that in faith, it will be done unto me according to my faith. You know, whenever people came to Jesus to be healed, he told them, according to your faith, be it done unto you. And if you have faith that your rotten life can be changed from this earthbound caterpillar existence into heaven-bound butterfly, that kind of picture, that you are no longer earthbound, but you are heavenly minded. If you have faith for that, then it will be done according to your faith. But if you don't believe that, like Jesus said to Martha, you, if you believe, you will see the glory of God, he said to her. She was telling the Lord, Lord, he's been dead for four days now, he must be stinking. And Jesus said, remove the stone. But Jesus insisted that the stone be removed. And after it was removed, you know, Jesus called out a dead person's name and he came out alive. That's what happened to us. We were all dead in our sins and trespasses. And when God called us, when the fullness of time came and we responded to God's gospel, the Lord called us and we responded. We came to him and he in his kindness and mercy, he forgave us all our sins and trespasses and made us new creations in Christ Jesus. And all the old things passed away and all of us are being renewed day by day. And this is what it means. Be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. The same thing it says further in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 23. Paul says, the same Apostle Paul, he says to the Ephesians church, that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. That means in your spirit, you be transformed by not walking according to the dictates of the flesh or of this world, but be renewed by God's word and God's spirit. And Titus 3, 5, it says, Titus was a young man like Timothy, Paul's co-worker. He writes to him in Titus 3, 5, he says, Jesus saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. See, washing of regeneration and renewal happens to us by the Holy Spirit. If the Holy Spirit doesn't quicken our uh, conscience or our dead spirits, then nothing will happen. There's no point in, you know, many people are happy to come to Sunday morning meeting for the sake of their own conscience, to ease their conscience. Oh yes, I went to church today. If I don't go, God may do something to me. Something bad may happen to me. That is not the reason why we come here. We come here to express our gratitude and thanks and praise to the Lord for all that he has done in the past and in the past week and how good he has been to us. And just as a small token of expression, we come here and we worship corporately. And this is not really worship. Worship is a much um, deeper thing than praise and thanksgiving. Worship is something that always costs us something. Like David said, um, he, he said to Arauna, when Arauna offered everything for free, he said, no, I will not take anything from you free. I will not offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. 
he paid for it if it has not cost us something then it is not true worship true worship costs us something what does it mean like it's like jesus said even on the last day he said of course he lived by that principle all the days of his life but on the last day he made it very clear it is just to say lord not my will but your will be done that is worship if jesus wanted he could have <clears throat> he could have called 12 legions of angels one legion is 6000 it is 72000 angels and you know the power of one angel we read in the old testament one time <coughs> that one small angel was able to slaughter about 185000 soldiers in one night if one soldier can slaughter 1 lakh 85000 people in one night multiply that into 72000 and see how many times more the whole world would have been wiped out at that time the population probably was less than a billion that time you see the power of one angel and you know the word uh, the word of god it says he washes us by his holy spirit regenerating us in our in us and renewing us by the holy spirit and then he makes us you see when jesus was confronting the scribes and the pharisees he told them one thing you guys you are interested in cleaning the outside of the cup but inside of the cup and the dish it is all you know filth now how do you feel if somebody gives you gutter water in a golden tumbler for you to drink how many of us accept it our outward testimony is like we are very careful lest we offend anybody or anybody thinks less of us we are so careful it's like our gold plated or golden vessel but inside most of um, christians so called christians their inward life is like gutter water and you give that to god lord i did this in your name i did that in your name what will the lord tell to such people on the on the day of judgment we read about that in matthew 7 22 i think he i will tell them depart from me you workers of iniquity i never knew you he said if jesus can disown such people who do, did so many things miracles and signs and wonders and healings preaching all in the name of jesus and to be told on that day depart from me i never knew you and which is more important jesus said first clean the inside of the cup and then he says he never says about cleaning the outside of the cup he said just concentrate upon your inner life your private life your thought life your mind and your attitude towards people you know david said in psalm 51 you desire truth in the inward part so god looks at the heart not our activities brothers and sisters i hope you are listening carefully god is not interested in your external activities for him that there are so many people to do that ultimately they will be rejected but he who keeps his heart pure and he who watches over his heart you know the lord will bless him the lord told samuel god 
does not look on the outward appearance of man but he looks at the heart and all those seven brothers elder brothers of david were rejected but this shepherd boy who was so neglected that they thought there were no nobody else after seven sons then samuel had to ask jesse is that all you have he said no there is one little boy there he is out in the field tending sheep and then you call him he was so despised and he was like non entity as it were in their family but his heart was right with god compared to including jesse's heart and his seven well built sons and god picked up that little shepherd boy and made him the king of israel one of the best kings that israel ever had even till today they call that david's star the israel's star what they represent you see god can change us god can transform us but only thing he wants us to know whether you are you and i are willing are you happy with your defeated life this corrupt life inside that is there in you this dirty mindset these dirty thoughts that haunt you day and night and make you trip all over again and again every day number of times and you are defeated and defeated and defeated but out, outwardly you have a smile and you have a testimony that you are a good brother or a good sister in the church but what does god think of you is he happy about your inner life or are you willing for the lord to project your thoughts on the screen like how it's being projected if only my thoughts can be projected and i'm willing for the lord to do that then that means that i'm walking in the light but if i'm not willing that means that i'm not straight forward i'm not walking in the light i'm walking in darkness and all those who walk in darkness hate the light paul said very clearly the bible says that but all those who love the truth they love to walk in the light and in the truth and before the face of god so that god can you know bear witness like he bore witness about his son jesus not because he was the son of god he lived as a man on this earth when he came he came in flesh like you and me and then the lord from heaven had to certify and say this is my beloved son in whom i am well pleased can god say that about us am i willing for my thought life to be displayed on the screen for everybody to see if i'm willing then i'm walking in the light if there is some hesitation then there is some darkness there then i must ask the lord lord have mercy on me change me from inside out change me from glory to glory so that the work may continue and if you have this kind of um desire in your heart there is hope for every one of us sitting here turn with me to ezekiel chapter 36 This is the promise that God Almighty has made to you and me. He says here in Ezekiel chapter 36 verses 25 onwards The Lord says then I will sprinkle clean water on you the water represents God's word and the holy spirit Jesus said in Luke 7:37 38 he said if any man thirsts let him come unto me and drink and he who believes in me out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living waters and this is what he is telling here i will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean 
And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. That is, I will do the internal cleaning of your heart and of your mind, of your thoughts and your motives and intentions. And your idols, filthiness, everything I will clean up. And the Lord says, verse 26, Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. It was a new spirit that entered into Lazarus when he was dead and stinking and he became a new Lazarus and God can make us new creations in Christ and I'll put a new spirit within you, give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you and I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. The hardened heart, that stony heart, God says, I will remove that from you, check it out, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And not only that, he says, I will put my spirit within you. That means I will put the Holy Spirit within you, the same spirit that came upon Jesus on the day when he was baptized in the river Jordan. The same Holy Spirit I will put within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. And you will be careful to observe my ordinances. This is God's promise. And you know what God wants from us? He says, I will do this for you, provided, verse 37, Verse 37, thus says the Lord, this also I will let the house of Israel ask me to do for them. If you ask the Lord to do this in your life and ask him to cleanse you from inside out and give you a new heart and a new mind and new attitude towards things towards people, towards God, then you shall be a new creation. Your life will change from glory to glory. It will become better by the day and the work of God will be complete on the day when he comes. If that's our heart's desire, then let's do what it says here. Let's ask the Lord I will let the um, house of Israel ask me to do this for them. So if you ask, you shall receive. And if you knock, it will be open. If you seek, you shall find it. So the Lord is not a disappointment. All to everyone, it says, everyone who asks shall receive. No exception. And this life of victory, this life of joy and peace and freedom from anxiety 24-7 can be yours and mine if only we ask the Lord and believe. Like Jesus said to Martha once more, I would like to repeat that. If you believe we shall see the glory of God. You can experience that glorious life in Christ and he can make you from a sinner into a saint. Remember, every saint had a past. We all have had a past. But every sinner has a glorious future. You may be the vilest offender or vilest sinner sitting here. You can be changed transformed and made acceptable to God just like the Apostle Paul or Peter or John. Your life can be changed like their life if only you humble yourself and come to the Lord in honesty and in sincerity. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Our Father in heaven, we thank you and praise you for this morning 
and for this time together with your people. Thank you for your word, Lord, and we thank you that your word is a light and a lamp, and we want to walk in the light as you are in the light, so that the blood of Christ can cleanse us from all our iniquities. Lord, we are willing to be made willing. We are willing to be changed, willing to be transformed into your likeness more and more. We ask that you will do that work in us through your word and through your Holy Spirit. Give us grace, we pray. Cleanse us, cleanse the inside of the cup and make us acceptable in your sight. Give us a deep repentance whenever we grieve you or fail you. Lord Jesus, let's go from here with faith in our hearts, believing that things will not be the same, but that it will be different from today onwards. We trust you to do that, Lord, and we praise you and worship you. In Jesus' name, amen.